started. Good morning, everybody. This is Michael Darger. I'm an extension specialist in community economics from the University of Minnesota Extension. I am on campus today in what I call Lonely Hall. I have explicit permission to be here, but otherwise, the University of Minnesota, we're all supposed to be working at home until at least December 31st. So welcome to you wherever you are, home offices, on the road, or your real office. Uh, I am joined here by my teammates on this project, which is sponsored by a grant from Michigan State University, the North Central Center for uh, Rural Development, and uh, Courtney Bur uh, Burner, sorry, and Esther West from the University of Wisconsin Center for Cooperatives. And I don't know if Kevin's here yet, but Kevin Edberg from the Community De uh, Cooperative Development Services out of St. Paul, Minnesota. We were teammates uh, on a grant that's winding down, which is all about introducing the concept of employee ownership, especially employee cooperatives, as a viable option for business succession and transition. Um, you know, for people who look like me, I'm a baby boomer, or other folks who want to transition out of their business uh, in the next uh, several years. So that's what we'll present on today. Glad you could join us. Um, we are uh, winding down this grant and we're recording this presentation today. So you can use this for future reference. We'll post it on our various websites and this will be uh, available um, you know, to support uh, those of you who, who wanna bring this concept to business owners or employees of businesses who aspire to be in the employee ownership uh, you know, uh, method of having a business. And, um, and we'll report our findings out. But we have 115 people registered for the event and it uh, looks like we've about half of, half of you are here so far. And get this poll, anyone who wants to take the poll, uh, looks like uh, just over half of you are economic or community developers, but we have some business owners, we have some people in the business support professional space, and we have uh, at least one person who's potentially interested in taking over business as an employee and several others. If those of you who are in the other category want to just kind of say what hat you're wearing today in the chat, go ahead. Uh, but welcome to everybody. So uh, we'll save questions for the end. And uh, Courtney will spend about uh, 35, 40 minutes introducing and, and presenting a comprehensive presentation of the retaining businesses through employee ownership um, concept. And Let's see, I think I covered everything. All good, if, if, uh, if you're ready, Courtney. I'll, uh, Courtney is again the director of the University of Wisconsin Center for Cooperatives and she will make the presentation today and we'll take questions. You can send your, chat, your questions in the chat at any time, but we'll queue them up and we'll have uh, about 20 minutes at the end for, for Q and A. Take away, Courtney. Great, uh, thank you so much, Michael. It's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, like Michael said, this presentation, this webinar um, is the sort of one of the final steps in um, a project that the four, our project team has been working on. Um, we delivered a roadshow in rural Minnesota and Wisconsin um, in early March, really snuck it in right before the world changed. It, um, it's actually, I was, just um, looking back at a, one of the, the recording of one of the sessions that we did and it felt like a different world. I was like, wow, that, that was before everything changed. So um, it's, and, and in many ways, the, the topic for today um, is just as relevant. Um, there are certainly some more things to think about. Uh, certainly a lot of business owners' um, uh, horizons have shifted. Um, but I think um, this question of how do we retain businesses, how do we retain jobs in rural communities um, is as critical, if not more critical. So I'm going to go ahead and share my um, screen here. So for our time today, uh, I'll hit three main um, topics. The first is really the nuts and bolts of employee ownership. What are we talking about um, when we're talking about employee ownership? The second is um, the steps in the conversion process. And the third is resources and how to get involved. So those are the three three places we will um, go today. And Michael, I would love it if you would turn off that poll because it keeps popping up okay. <laughs> in the yeah. middle of my screen. I don't know why. I keep closing is it. Is it gone now? Uh, I closed it, so um, oh, okay. it went away. But it keeps popping back up right in the middle. Um, it's fine if it keeps going, but I, I might have to pause occasionally and get rid of it. So, all right, let's jump in. 
So um, more than half of you are in the field of economic development. This information is not going to be a surprise to you in any way. Um, as you know, uh, there is a lot of business, the, the need for a lot of business succession on the horizon. Um, based on some of the research we've done, there are, you know, are more businesses that were founded by those born between 1946 and 1964 than any other generation. Um, over half of U.S. companies with employees are owned by baby boomers. And um, a lot of different entities have done research on succession planning and how many business owners have actual written plans in place or a, a sort of a formalized exit strategy. And it's estimated between those different studies that 60 to 80, 85% of business owners have no exit strategy. So if you're someone that's in the BRE, the business retention and expansion field, um, you might be really familiar with this if you're out having conversations with business owners. Um, so, um, you know, we've, in our world, you know, we've been trying to um, promote the idea of employee ownership as a business succession strategy for quite some time now. And uh, when we first started talking about this, it was really future focused. You know, this wave of bo baby boomer retirements is coming. It's coming. We need to start talking to business owners and start getting this, um, this idea out there in case it's right for someone. And um, the days of talking about this as though it's going to happen in the future are over. This is um, this wave of baby boomer retirements. Um, and their business successions is here now. Um, we're, we're in it. I think um, the oldest baby boomers turned 73 in 2019. Um, so this is happening now. And um, as many of you know, particularly if you're doing um, business development in rural communities, um, you know, most jobs come from existing businesses that are growing. And so, you know, your best, one of your best economic development strategies is to hold on to the businesses you have. Um, and that is really what we're talking about here today um, and one of the strategies for doing that. Okay. Oops. So what are the small business succession options? I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. Um, this isn't uh, really about, you know, all the ways to um, do succession planning, but we do want to just talk through um, some of the strategies. So um, on the right hand side, you have the business closes. So maybe that's a liquidation, um, you're losing jobs, services, and a tax base. Potentially there's a sale to an outside interest, um, which looks promising um, from the outset, but that new owner has the option to consolidate operations and really eliminate um, jobs or, or locations, which in many ways for a community feels the same as a business closure. Um, so then on the business continuity side, um, if it's a family business, that, might, that, that business might stay in the family. Um, the likelihood of businesses getting passed down from generation to generation goes down as it keeps moving down, um, but that certainly is an option. Again, there might be a sale to an outside interest, a direct sale, um, in which case, you know, where the, the, the jobs are retained, the business, the retail locations, whatever, whatever that makes up that business, um, those things are retained in sort of their original format. Um, and that might actually be great for the community too. Um, there might be a management buyout. So some people are familiar with employee ownership in the context of the management team or some subset of the management team purchasing the business. Um, and that can be a direct sale that might be combined with an ESOP. And I'll talk about what an ESOP is um, later in the presentation. And then lastly is this a sale to the employees. And so this most often takes place in the form of an ESOP or a worker cooperative. There are a couple of other structures, but they are fairly new and um, not commonly used in the United States. So um, interestingly, you know, interest and investment in employee ownership is on the rise. I think there are a handful of reasons for this. Um, one, uh, it was a reaction to the Great Recession, and it's sort of interesting talking about the Great Recession now as we're entering a sort of period of uncertainty around um, our economic future in the, in the coming years. But um, certainly coming out of 2008, 2009, um, a lot of interest in employee ownership and ways of sort of democratizing the economy. How do we make it more fair um, for more people? So um, secondly, there are a lot of people that are looking at employee ownership as a tool for achieving some other social or economic goals, um, whether it's 
uh, related to the, you know, the wealth gap, wage gaps, um, creating um, higher quality living wage jobs. Um, but increasingly, this model is getting attention um, from places that it didn't get attention as much. So, the, um, you know, these, this is just a sort of smattering of fairly recent news articles or news stories. They were fairly recent, at least in, in March. Um, of different folks getting involved. So there's foundations that are putting more money into employee ownership. There are municipalities that are supporting this as an economic development strategy. The city of Madison, for example, made a, a very significant investment in um, worker ownership, both in terms of startups and conversions um, as, as an economic development strategy, um, as part of the city's economic development strategy. So, and then this reason that I think we're really seeing a rise in interest, um, both from sort of traditional parties and some newer players like foundations and municipalities, um, is around this idea of business succession and job retention. Um, and that uh, it's, it's, you know, there's sort of a fever pitch, you know, in terms of it being a really important issue and needing to um, be proactive and find new tools for holding on to some of these jobs. So, um, interest in this topic is uh, certainly on the rise. So what are some of the benefits of employee ownership? Um, one is that it's just a financially rewarding exit path and there's some potential tax benefits for selling owners. We'll talk about those uh, in a minute. Um, one of the things I hear a lot is that it can be a lasting legacy for the selling owner. If you know there were a handful of business owners I saw in that poll, I think um, seven or eight, and um, most people who spent their life's work building a business, <laughs> um, you know, I hear a lot of people refer to their business as their baby. Um, it's not something they just want to cast off when they're done to the highest bidder to do what they want with the business. Um, you know, that a, a big component of developing their succession plan or success, succession strategy is um, building a legacy. It's, it's taking care of the business. It's taking care of their employee to help them build the business. It's doing right by their community. Um, so that is, that, that piece can't, I think, be underestimated. Uh, it also, you know, rewards employees for the role in building the business. Um, most business owners know that uh, their employees are a huge piece of their success um, and they want to reward those employees. They don't want to leave them out of a job. Um, there's been quite a bit of research done on the impact of employee ownership on uh, business performance and productivity. Most of that research comes out of the ESOP world, not the, the worker co-op world. Um, but it's, uh, it's been shown that uh, particularly when there's a, a true um, feeling of ownership and a little bit more control by employees, that employee ownership really has the potential to both improve employee engagement and productivity and retention and um, business performance overall. And then lastly, you know, we, I've talked about this already, you know, it, it retains, um, converting a business to employee ownership retains those services, jobs, wealth, tax base in the local community. And um, a business that's owned by people who live in that community is much less likely to get up and leave. Um, those people are embedded in that community. Um, and so in terms of retaining those services, jobs, wealth, and tax base into the long, into the future, um, I'd argue that there's a higher likely, uh, likelihood that that will take place um, when the employees own that business. So I want to briefly mention um, the tax benefit because that's something um, that often sparks people's attention, um, sparks people's interest. So there's something called 1042 rollover. Uh, it was established in the 80s as a tax break for selling owners. Um, it's available to both um, in the case of a conversion, conversion to a worker co-op and to an ESOP, though they're used much more frequently by ESOPs. Um, and so the gist of the 1042 rollover, and I want to say I'm not an accountant, I'm not an attorney. Um, uh, this is like, I can't go much deeper here. Um, I can certainly point you in the direction of people who can help you better understand Ten, the 1042 rollover and whether or not it might apply in a given situation or be appropriate. Um, but I can do a fairly surface level treatment um, of it. Uh, but again, I'm happy to refer you out to others who can walk you through the, the nitty gritty details. But essentially the idea is that the selling business owner um, gets to defer tax 
on the capital gains from the sale if they do the following. So they have to sell at least 30% of the business to their employees via an ESOP or a worker co-op. In a worker co-op, they're always sell selling 100% of the business to the employees. So that 30% threshold is really in the case of an ESOP. And then second, secondly, they need to reinvest the proceeds into qualified replacement properties within 12 months of the sale. And that's often where that big question comes. What do you mean by qualified replacement property as well? That's a conversation to have someone who's better qualified to have it. Um, it's complex. Um, it's not always the right fit um, for folks, but it is a, ta you know, it is a tax benefit um, that exists if the selling owner is interested and able to take advantage of it. So I want to quickly talk about ESOPs um, before diving into to worker cooperatives, which is the main model that we will talk about today. So, um, but ESOPs are actually the most common form of employee ownership in the United States. You've probably seen some of the logos that are up on the screen right now. You might have even wondered, what does it mean that they're employee owned? Um, I teach a class, I'm about to start teaching my class next week on cooperatives here at UW Madison. And um, when I ask students, you know, what co-ops do you know? Or like what, you know, what employee owned businesses do you know? Um, they often say Woodman's or um, PDQ, or, you know, if they might be from somewhere else in the country, they might share another um, brand that is actually an ESOP. And I say, well, actually it's not a co-op, but here, you know, it is, this, it is a form of employee ownership, but it's different from a, a cooperative in several key ways. So essentially when an ESOP is created, the business owner sells some or all of their shares to an ESOP trust that owns those shares on behalf of the employees. Um, and then uh, that trust is sort of the intermediary between the employees and the business. And really it's, it's a, a benefit plan um, that can be used to share ownership with employees, but it is highly regulated. Um, they're fairly expensive to set up and maintain. Um, and again, the ESOP, that ESOP trust um, can own anywhere from 1% to 100% of the company. So you notice that PDQ Food Stores said, you know, 100% employee owned. When they had an ESOP, um, that comp the ESOP owned 100% of the company. In the case of Woodman's, the ESOP does not own 100% of the company. So, um, and what comes with ESOPs is really financial ownership, but generally there's no control over the business um, associated with those ownership shares. Um, and so many ESOPs have sort of ownership cultures that encourage employees to think and act like owners, but it's not necessarily built into the model. Um, the ESOP itself is really just this federally governed benefit plan. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that folks, and they tend to be, uh, so when folks come to us interested in selling their business to their employees, potentially, um, you know, we talk through, you know, does it make sense for you to pursue an ESOP or to pursue potentially a worker cooperative? And some of the factors that might um, determine that are the size of the business, um, the number of employees, sort of the payroll, um, and what the selling owner is thinking in terms of staging that sale. Generally, larger businesses um, with a higher number of employees um, are more appropriate for ESOPs because they are fairly uh, expensive to set up and maintain. So now let's um, move on to cooperatives. So a cooperative is a business that is owned and democratically controlled by the people who use its services. So those members, so there are members in a cooperative, they elect the board, they approve changes to the bylaws. Um, they, in the case of a worker cooperative, they met would be the owners also of the business. Um, and in a worker cooperative, I think it's important to point out that you may still have a fairly traditional management structure. Um, what we're really talking about here is the governance structure. So you have the members, they elect the board of directors. The board of directors um, governs and leads that business on behalf of the members. It's really focused on high level questions, strategy, uh, the financial well-being, health of that business. Um, and then the board of directors hires management. Um, the management hires and supervises employees. Um, and in a worker cooperative, so this graphic is one we use to describe all types of cooperatives, and I'll mention the different types of cooperatives in a minute. Um, but in a worker cooperative, that, that this one, two, three, four might actually be a, a closed loop where um, the group of employees can apply to become members, and then it um, 
and there'd be members on the board and in the management structure as well. So, um, but the key things here are that really a, a cooperative is a tool. It's a tool um, to create a business that is member owned, member controlled, and the members benefit based on their use of the cooperative. So there are several different types of cooperatives. We tend to, at the Center for Co-ops here in Wisconsin, sort of um, divide them up based on who the members are. Um, consumer cooperatives are cooperatives that are owned by the people who um, are, you know, are trying to band together to get better pricing access on goods, services. So rural electric cooperatives, grocery cooperatives tend to be consumer owned. REI is the largest consumer owned co-op consumer co in the country. Um, we also have producer cooperatives. Generally, we think of farmers owning producer cooperatives, but an artist, artists could be owners of a, a producer cooperative. They're essentially, the cooperative is aggregating, potentially adding value, marketing goods on behalf of those members. So here's Ocean Spray, um, a very large national cooperative, farmer-owned cooperative um, in the U.S. Uh, purchasing cooperatives are, um, I kind of love them because they're these sort of behind the scenes and um, purchasing cooperatives make it possible for many of our sort of main street businesses to remain viable, particularly when they're in industries where there's quite a lot of consolidation. So Ace Hardware um, is a cooperative and it's owned by all of the independent Ace Hardware location owners. And by banding together, they're able to get better pricing on um, their inputs, they have shared marketing, shared store design layout, um, other administrative support um, that helps them remain competitive so that uh, they can um, stay in business despite the fact that, you know, there's Home Depot, Lowe's, um, those sorts of businesses. So um, you often find purchasing cooperatives in industries where there's been quite a bit of consolidation um, and uh, there's a lot of competition. So. Multi-stakeholder and then worker cooperatives, which we'll talk about more in a moment, are cooperatives that are owned by the people who work there. Um, Multi-stakeholder cooperatives are much less common. They are owned by one or more sort of membership class. So uh, an example is a grocery cooperative in North Carolina that actually has consumers and workers as owners in that business. And there's two separate membership classes. So let's focus though on what a worker cooperative is. So again, workers own the business, they democratically control the business and profits are distributed to workers in proportion to their labor contribution. Labor contribution is often um, measured by the hours worked, but different worker cooperatives have different ways of doing that. Um, like I said earlier, there are a lot of different ways to actually structure a worker cooperative. And you know, there, there's a, a, a broad continuum of um, management structures, governance structures. Um, you've got everything from the, you know, five person collective that makes all their decisions together and everyone is paid the same rate, the wage. I think that's sometimes the like, um, um, the idea that people have in their mind. Um, and then you have, you know, Mondragon, Spain, the largest worker cooperative, I would argue, in the world that is a, a huge and competitive international manufacturing, I and mean, they have many, many branches of their um, cooperative. So um, that has a much more traditional management structure, and it's quite sophisticated. Um, the largest worker-owned cooperative in the United States is a home care cooperative in the Bronx, and it has around 2,000 worker owners. So this is a model that can be really small and flat, it's a model that can scale um, and be quite large and sophisticated. Um, but regardless of where the business, where the cooperative falls along the continuum, um, these three things remain true, that the workers own it, they, they invest equity in the business, they control the business democratically by electing the board of directors. Um, and in, the, in worker cooperatives, there's often other ways in which both information and decision making is, is sort of pushed down into the front lines to try to um, really engage those workers in the business in many levels of the business. And again, profits are distributed in proportion to their labor contribution. So now I'm going to talk about a few examples because I think stories are more powerful than um, sort of concepts. And so I wanna walk you through three different examples of businesses that have converted to employee ownership. And 
Um, they're different sizes, they're different industries, um, and they're in different parts of the country. And um, that was intentional. I think uh, there are, this is a phenomenon that's not just happening in one part of the country. It's not just happening in one industry. Um, worker cooperatives are really in some way like any other business. It's a, you know, but it's a group of people that comes together to identify a product or a service that they then sell. <laughs> it just so happens that, um, you know, and with the goal of generating enough revenue to support themselves and the business owners um, and the business. And um, it just so happens that these businesses, you know, ownership is shared across the employee base. Um, and I just want to mention, this is a question I get often is, you know, not all employees have to be members of a worker co-op. There are different, many different ways to set it up. Um, in some worker cooperatives, all of the employees are members and in others, um, they're not structured that way for a variety of reasons. Um, so. so let's start with Northwind Solar, a great local story um, here in central Wisconsin. So Northwind was established in 2007 by Josh Stolzenberg. Um, and fairly soon after establishing the business, he added three uh, part business partners who became co-owners in the business. Uh, Josh came to a seminar that we put on, I wanna say in 2012 or 20, I think it was 2013. Um, no, it was later than that. I think it was 2013, 2014. Um, and was interested in, in potentially selling the business to his employees and, um, we began working with them. Um, I worked with them on some education and structuring the deal um, and sort of working with his employees on, on what this could look like. And in 2017, he converted, they converted the business to a worker co-op and they launched with six worker owners and have since grown to 12. It might be up to 13 now. Um, this is an instance where the um, selling owners actually stayed with the business. So I know we opened up the presentation talking a lot about business succession and, and baby boomers, um, but in many cases, business owners, you know, are thinking they, they either are interested in sharing the, um, the advantages and the disadvantages of ownership with a broader group of people. Um, they see employee ownership as a way to improve their management, governance, and decision-making structures. Um, they see as a, a method by which to get more engagement from employees. Um, and, and so in, in many cases, business owners are staying with the business. Um, you know, Josh is about my age and, and was not looking at all four of the business owners actually stayed. So, um, so yeah, so this is again, an example of business owners staying with the business. Um, and they have had a really, the, the conversion has been really successful for them. They have continued to grow and have had some of their best years coming out of that conversion. And one of the things that was really important for them to think about, the selling owners to think about as they were um, approaching this was sort of the, the growth trajectory of their business. And they chose to do uh, evaluation fairly early on um, and stuck with that valuation because they were really trying to balance sort of, you know, what they would get out of the business as selling owners um, with their desire for the deal to be feasible um, for the employees to actually buy the business from them. And so they probably took a slightly lower um, pay price for the business because they wanted, they had this long-term goal and vision of including employees in the business and they thought that was the best strategy. Um, so, uh, after each introduction, I will talk a little bit about the financing for that deal. So this one is fairly straightforward. It was 100% seller financing. And um, in most of these deals, actually, there's a, a pretty significant portion of seller financing. Um, and in this case, they didn't want to engage the banks. They, they took, um, basically, they had, I think, five-year notes that each selling owner got. Um, and it was fairly clean. And it was also not a huge deal. So it was $350,000. So fairly simple. The next example is Real Pickles. It's a worker owned food manufacturing cooperative in Massachusetts. They produce fermented foods like kimchi, kraut, pickles. Um, Dan Rosenberg founded it in 2001. His wife joined the business uh, a year or so later. Um, they also were looking to stay with the business. So they are older and I, I think will probably exit the business um, 
in the next decade or so, but wanted to stay with the business. Again, wanted to um, engage their employees more deeply in the business. And so in 2013, converted. Um, they provide, were provided technical assistance by Cooperative Development Institute, which is out on the East Coast as well. So this is a slightly bigger deal, around 750000 And two reasons I like to highlight this deal in um, this presentation. One, it's food manufacturing, which is an industry um, that is, you know, uh, um, really important here in Wisconsin and also in Minnesota. And so, um, and secondly, um, they used an interesting financing mechanism to finance this business. So, um, you will notice that that blue 67% is actually equity from community investors. So Real Pickles has a really strong following of consumers who love their products. So businesses that are actually have consumer facing products, um, this could be a viable strategy for raising equity capital um, to finance the deal. So Real Pickles did a direct public offering um, they raised uh, whatever that is, 67% of $750,000, um, around $500,000 from 77 community investors. And um, they were able to then leverage that equity from community investors to um, get a line of credit and um, secure some senior debt from uh, CFNE, which is the Cooperative Fund of New England, it's a CDFI that um, supports cooperatives in New England. And then the, the worker owners also put in some equity. So what's interesting about this direct public offering is that you know, typically when um, an investor is interested in investing in a business, they want some sort of control <laughs> for um, an exchange for their investment, which is, you know, makes sense. Um, but when you have a cooperative structure where control resides with the members, it can be difficult to attract investors um, because those members have set up a cooperative because they want control of the business and are um, hesitant to relinquish, um, relinquish some control. So in this case, those 77 community investors um, have no control rights in the cooperative. Um, the goal is to pay a 4% dividend on those, um, on those equity shares. So essentially the members were able to um, raise equity from the community, really not only financial investment, but emotional investment from their consumers who really wanna see them succeed um, both because they love their products and because they've literally invested in the business and they didn't have to exchange any voting rights um, for that equity investment. So interesting model, um, particularly I think for businesses that have, um, consumer facing brands. The last co-op I'll talk about is the Island Employee Cooperative. It is on Deer Isle in Maine and um, uh, it's literally on an island and um, the cooperative is an umbrella of three other businesses. So there's a grocery store, um, there's a gas station and then there's a um, sort of hardware variety goods store. And so the selling owners of these businesses operated them for 43 years and um, these businesses are crucial to this island in several ways they're the largest employer on an island that doesn't have a lot of employee pros employment prospects and they also provide critical goods and services on an island <laughs> one of the few some of the few places to actually procure goods and services so it was really critical to the selling owners um, that this business, these, this set of businesses stay intact and they were worried if they sold to an outside um, buyer that they would actually, you know, consolidate operations and lay off employees. It was a really, a real concern to them. And some of these employees, one of the employees had been with them for, you know, since the first business opened in the 70s. So this is really, had really become a family. So the, um, the business converted in 2014, uh, 60 employees, over 45 of those were worker owners. The selling owners did exit the business. They were ready to retire. They wanted out. Um, this was a fairly complex deal. Again, provided support by Cooperative Development Institute. So this is the largest of the three deals. Um, the sale price, I think, was around 4.5 million. Um, 
but the full deal was $5.6 million. And it was a mix of um, senior debt from National Cooperative Bank, um, some senior debt from another local lender, and then from CFNE, the one I mentioned earlier, Cooperative Fund of New England. And then some seller financing that 9%. The piece I wanna call out here that's unique to this deal um, is that there was a significant portion also of vendor debt. So one of their suppliers, um, had a you know strong interest in this set of businesses not going away i imagine it was an important customer of theirs and so they actually um provided you know 27 percent of the financing uh via debt for the for in exchange for a first position on inventory um to move this project forward and so i think um again an example of the unique ways that these deals can be financed with everything from seller financing to vendor debt um, different combinations of um, debt and credit from different banks and um, CDFIs. So, and then um, of course, member equity is usually a piece of the equation as well. So now I just want to spend a little bit of time walking through the steps in the transition process. And um, there are a lot of different ways to talk about these steps, um, but we're gonna do sort of a high level treatment here. And this is how we divvy them up. So explore, assess, structure, complete, support. And um, in the, the accompanying boxes, sort of an estimate of how long it takes um, and how much money might be involved in that step. Again, these are estimates. Um, it really, really depends on the specific deal and circumstances. I've had, you know, I've been in conversations with a business owner going on five years i was yeah i was not pregnant when we started talking and my son's now will be four in december so um sometimes you know it's that explore phase um can vary and it can be a few years while someone um really thinks through the thinks through the process um the business might be going through you know up times down times um so but we've also had deals we just supported a deal in northern wisconsin earlier this year um, that, you know, from start to finish, I think was about four to five months, which is, is fast, um, not necessarily recommended. So this first step, explore. This is where the key stakeholders decide if the idea is worth pursuing. For those of you on the phone who are business owners, you, not, you might just be starting this phase today on this webinar. Um, the questions that we ask during this phase are, you know, is the business a good fit for the worker co-op model? What are the basic legal and financial realities? Um, so as a business owner, you're thinking, trying to learn about the model, trying to learn about um, you know, if your business might be a good fit. You're thinking about, I often ask business owners when I have conversations during this phase with them, you know, what are your goals? What, what are you, you know, what are your financial goals? What timeline do you have in mind in terms of exiting the business? Um, have you spoken with your employees? Um, have you had evaluation done? Just really trying to understand um, what their desires are, their concerns, the realities of the business owner. Um, so um, moving out of this phase is when a, a decision is made about whether to invest resources in moving forward with this process. And I would say that most of the time I'm having these initial conversations with business owners, although we have supported deals where the employees um, have been the ones to step forward and say, you know, we think our business owner is ex, you know, is, is nearing retirement. We don't think they have a plan. Um, we don't want to lose our jobs. We care a lot about biz this business. So there definitely are instances when the employees are leading, leading the charge and really initiating this explore process. Next is assess. And, um, during this stage, as the name would suggest, we're trying to understand and assess if, uh, if a conversion to a worker cooperative is feasible. And so feasibility is, you know, the feasibility question is about financial feasibility. It's about sort of the culture and terms of that business. Is it feasible um, based on, you know, how the employees that we have in place right now um, to actually sell the business to the employees? What questions do we need to answer around financing? Is the selling owner willing to invest um, and can they, uh, can they provide some financing? So often an outside professional is um, brought in to help 
assess this feasibility. Um, we strongly recommend that a third party valuation is done of the business. Um, you know, sometimes business owners have an inflated sense of what their business is worth. And um, it's nice to have a third party who at least can provide a starting point for negotiations around the sale price. Um, because ultimately we want the employees, the selling owners to come out of this transaction feeling like it was transparent and fair and like everyone, you know, the win-win, everyone really um, had their needs met. So um, one of those, like I said, non-financial feasibility assessments is sort of what's the ownership readiness of the employees and then are there gaps? So if um, the selling owner is exiting, what relationships, um, knowledge, skills do they have that are essential to the business that need to be replaced in some way? And so I've um, one of the companies that I worked with, they actually hired an operations manager um, before, you know, to prepare for um, the exit of the selling owner. And that was one of their steps um, after assessing sort of the, the, the management structure and the operation structure and what would happen when that, that selling owner left. Next is structure, and that's when um, the transition team really determines the sale terms and what organizational changes might take place. So um, this first question of you know, who will make conversion related decisions and how, I actually like to do that a little earlier in the process. You know, it's this interesting space where you have a business owner who has real control over decision making, who's exploring selling the business to a larger group of people, um, who will then own the business and sort of like who there's a lot of muddiness in between, <laughs> you know, start and end. And so how do we make decisions? Who gets to make which decisions about the structure of the deal, about the structure of the new cooperative? Um, so really like to sit down early with the some key employees and the selling owner to um, better understand sort of who how, how they're all going to be involved in the decision making along um, the, the path. So um, the, you know, this, uh, during this part, you really structure the documents, structure the new cooperative, structure the deal. Um, the next step, if you've done all the other steps um, fairly well, are, you know, complete. So the loans are drawn, the company legally changes hands, um, and poof, you have a cooperative um, a founding board of directors is established to govern. Um, it's often made up of some of the members of that transition team that um, work closely on structuring the deal and have been involved. And then lastly is support. So um, we don't wanna just be creating these worker cooperatives and sending them out into the ether um, to fend for themselves. So part of this, um, this process is really making sure that there's a long-term plan in place for supporting that ownership culture, for building that ownership culture, um, for supporting this new business in their new democratic ownership structure. So in the cases when the selling owners haven't left, um, oftentimes, you know, you're, you may not change the management structure right away. You're changing the governance structure and that you now have this board of directors, but the cooperative, um, you know, the, the, the reporting relationships might remain the same. But when you have someone who's left and has taken a lot of knowledge and skills and relationships with them, um, we want to make sure that, you know, there's a, a support team in place, um, whether it's helping them review financials, um, doing training on governance, uh, you know, supporting their board as they um, sort of get established in their new role. Um, uh, connecting them with peer peer co-ops in other parts of the country as well. All right, so um, lastly, I just, you know, want to make sure that you're aware that there are resources out there. So if you are a business owner who's exploring this, if you are an economic development professional who's talking to business owners or employees a lot, um, that you don't have to have all the answers for the, you know, for this, that there are co-op development professionals um, at the national level, regionally, um, there are accountants and attorneys and financing entities um, that are familiar with cooperatives. And part of this work is um, really building an ecosystem of support for these businesses um, from that explore phase all the way through to the support. Um, 
And so if, you know, if you're interested in having a longer conversation about a specific project or how you can support businesses in your community, um, you know, there's me, there's Michael, there's Kevin and Esther, um, our project team, but there's also these other um, resources out in the community. So I think I will stop there. And take All right. Any questions um, if there are any. Yeah, there have been several questions in the chat, and it's uh, good we've been uh, just kind of a conversation on the side. So you were staying focused, and that's a good thing. I'll throw the first question I think is the most pertinent on the business uh, conversion to uh, worker co ops is the one from Annalise uh, with respect to business valuation. Can any qualified valuation service do this, or are there special questions, considerations for co op conversions? I, 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 so generally the um, valuations are done just for people who do any kind of business valuation. So I don't think in terms of setting the sale price um, or setting the, you know, all standard rules apply, um, even if you're converting. And oftentimes a business owner that is exploring their options has done a valuation before they've even, or had a third party valuation done before they've even gone down the path of exploring employee, employee ownership and that that valuation still holds. So. Great, and that's what I thought. Um, Nancy had a couple of questions. One was about Ace Hardware's creation story, but I think that's uh, really about, you know, a big purchasing cooperative. But a more specific question to this topic today, and there's, I'm sure there's plenty of information out there uh, about Ace, and if, if, if you or Esther can track it down, we can, I can put that in the follow-up email uh, to the participants, but she had a question about, do you know of any conversion sales of one site of a chain, I'm assuming like a chain store, or a, you know, a, a chain location to a group representing a worker co-op or an, basically an employee cooperative conversion, I think is what she's getting at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually it's, um, it was just, I'm on this, we're part of this national network of organizations focused on trying to increase um, knowledge about this option and I'm on this listserv and just this morning before as I was getting ready for this um, there was a flurry of emails about Ace Hardware's actually um, and someone was asking if they'd ever supported a conversion of an Ace Hardware and Rob who actually supported the main employee um, exam co-op example chimed in and said he's helped support two Ace Hardware's to become um, worker cooperatives so in the context of Ace Hardware, yes. Um, in the context of one location in a, um, in like a chain, um, it would be possible. I don't know of something like that where like, because they would actually be owning it. So if it was like, you know, I, I will say that in, a, in the case of a um, franchise, that it would be possible for a group of workers to purchase a franchise and run it as a worker cooperative. Um, and there's actually a couple people that have been doing a lot of thinking about how to actually get that to happen. Um, I don't know if it has, but um, yeah. Okay, um, there was another question from Joseph a while back, which was basically talking about, um, about what economists would call market failures. So for instance, a co-op, uh, is, it, is it a situation where co-ops can go in there and not be so concerned about the profit motive but try to address critical community needs, such as food deserts and lack of, of locally available foods, nutritious foods in you know, what we call food deserts. And Nancy responded by saying, well, the Seward Co-op in South Minneapolis is a good example because they have their main store in Franklin Avenue and they opened up like a sister branch, not far from actually where the George Floyd killing happened, unfortunately, this earlier this summer. They opened a store in that neighborhood. So that's one example she threw up, but any, any kind of comments that you, and we also have been joined by Kevin Edberg, who's one of our partners. So Kevin, if you have a mic where you are in your remote location, feel free to join in, but let's let Courtney uh, go first on that one. Sure, so I think um, what I like to say is that um, when you have a market failure that's so vast, I like to talk about childcare sometimes. People ask me, well, can childcare co-ops could it, if you just made it a co-op, could the like childcare center, could we use co-ops to fix the childcare crisis? And I say, sure, there are a lot of ways in which co-ops can be used to sort of nibble around the edges of that problem. Um, 
but when there's clearly a, a sort of a such a big failure and mismatch and a lack of public investment um you know the co-op model is not a panacea that said co-ops exist to meet member needs so in worker cooperatives it's really the, the it's providing employment gainful employment but in the case of a grocery cooperative um a, a producer cooperative the co-op does not exist to maximize profit and so um Whereas it might not make sense for an investor owned firm to um, to do what the cooperative is doing because they wouldn't be able to generate enough profit. Um, so a co-op might come in because they're not profit oriented, but they're still it, it's still a business and it needs to be able to generate enough revenue to support its costs like any business. So co-ops can't make magic. <laughs> um, but because of their very different orientation towards meeting member needs, um, they can, their, their priorities are different. It shifts decision making, it shifts strategy. Um, and so they are able to do things that profit maximizing investor owned firms won't do. Um, it's a, it's a short, it's, a, it's as simple of an answer as I can give to that. Um, that. Great. Well, let's see if Kevin has a microphone. Kevin did chime in. Yeah. In the chat. Go ahead, Kevin. So I think of cooperatives as one part of the spectrum of mission driven businesses. Um, and certainly there are other forms of mission driven enterprises that uh, we find scattered across the economy in, in multiple ways. But it's that focus on the mission that connects people to the, hey, why are we here? Are we getting, what, are we getting our needs met um, at least reasonably and perhaps better than other alternatives? And I think the, the critical component of that is, you know, is it at least a reasonable alternative to other, um, uh, to other alternatives that are available to the, to the owners? Um, the International Cooperative Association says that a cooperative exists to meet both economic, social, and cultural needs. So um, for those of us who think predominantly from an economic lens, sometimes we need to step back from that and say, what are the social and cultural needs that might also be part of that value equation that is not met by other alternatives? So. You know, it's, it's, it's more, it, it, it's, it, as Courtney said, th there is a business. It has to, over time, have uh, enough resources to keep uh, the infrastructure and everything uh, working, but there are a number of ways of meeting that. And so perhaps kind of like the church, sometimes there's community fundraisers to, to fill in gaps or to find other ways of meeting needs because the mission is really important. Great, thanks, Kevin. And uh, are you are you at home or are you in Montana? Yeah, I'm leaving. This is the last activity before I hop in a car and start driving to uh, Western Montana. All right, great. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, there is a, a hot question here that Brett just submitted. What kind of compensation do the professionals you mentioned charge to work on these types of transactions? Flat fee, percentage of sale, etc. Courtney, you want to take a whack at that? Yeah, it depends. So um, if the business falls in a rural community, we, so the UW Center for Cooperatives as a, we receive extension funding and some grant funding. So we can generally offer our services at a low, low to no cost, especially if you're in a rural community. Um, you know, attorneys charge what attorneys charge. Um, I will say no more on that. Um, so it depends on the attorney, but um, some of the groups, so the ICA group, um, CD at Cooperative Development Services, Kevin's organization, and Project Equity are three groups that engage in sort of that feasibility analysis deal structure. Um, and it's usually a flat fee. It's not usually a percentage. Um, and it, I mean, it really, it depends on the complexity of the deal. It depends on um, how good of shape the financials are in. Um, <laughs> so how much time does the group have to spend untangling things? Um, depends on how long the deal takes, but I've generally seen it structured as flat fees or um, sort of hourly rate, not a percentage. I will say that sometimes the cost of supporting um, the deal structure and then ongoing support has been wrapped up into the financing um, and it's paid for that way. And oftentimes lenders feel pretty, feel better about that, having some 
money built in um, to pay for ongoing technical assistance to the business. That reminds they're not me. not as expensive as ESOPs, but they're, I, I like to tell people that there are going to be some costs along the way um, just to be upfront. And, and that reminds me, uh, Courtney, that along the way on this project together, some of us have had some, you know, basic, uh, you know, um, ballpark figures for how much an employee would, would typically put into buying, becoming one of these employee owner co-ops. So I know at one point, Kevin had kind of a used car uh, rule of thumb, like, you know, it, it could be ten, twenty thousand $20,000, which is a lot of money, but it's not like taking over the whole. So any, any kind of comments, and of course it depends on the type of business, but yeah, I've seen it range from, you know, $25 in an industry that's low wage <laughs> um, and they didn't really didn't want to make becoming a member a barrier um, that making the, the financial piece a barrier to, um, like you mentioned, you know, pegged to the cost of a good used car. So I think Isthmus Engineering here in Ma Madison, um, which is a worker owned cooperative manufacturing and engineering cooperative is around $20,000 now. Um, but anywhere, you know, a thousand, two thousand, five thousand, ten thousand, again, depends on the size of the business, depends on, um, the industry. Um, okay. but uh, you, often there's a, a payment plan built in so that, um, someone could have payroll deduction over time to help them work towards that. And then they might have some time after becoming a member to complete their equity buy-in. So the point is, this is a very doable thing for almost all employees if they choose to be a, an employee owner, which is a big decision. And I think that's a great segue to, I think this can be our last question. And I just wanna remind people that we are recording this session. We will, post, uh, we will post this to the website. We also will share with you the slides and there's an evaluation for this session, but we'll have an evaluation for that recorded session. But Miles Alexander has a really pertinent question. Please say more about employee readiness and education and support needed from the change from, you know, just being an employee uh, with no responsibilities at owner to also being an owner comments on that it's really important and some of the deals that i see the conversions that i see that are really successful the selling owners have actually been laying the groundwork for this for quite some time even before they've talked to employees about um about their idea of selling to them um, they've been you know pulling more people into the management team um, having, you know, quarterly meetings with all the employees where they're talking about the financial performance, um, really opening up the books in ways that they might not have before. So I always encourage business owners, if they're thinking of, of going in this direction, to start the process of pulling more employees in and trying to build that ownership culture as early as possible. Um, that said, even if you haven't done that, <laughs> if a business owner hasn't done that, there have been plenty of successful conversions where the business owner has really just exited and has done no favors on the, the cultural side. Um, uh, so yeah, there are groups like ours, um, other national groups that can come in and provide some of that support. Um, it's, really, it's a really important piece and you can build it over time. Um, and I don't know, Kevin, if you have anything else you want to say to, to that end. No, um, spot on. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. Um, there was a bunch of other discussion in the chat and I will try to download the chat log and send it to you all with the evaluation link because um, there's some really good stuff in the chat. And I, some, I know some people kind of pay attention to chat, some don't, but since there were some nice side conversations, we'll send that along. I'll also get the link uh, from Esther. Uh, Esther, I think I'll call you after this call and find the latest link. And so we'll try to send you folks all the information we have. We thanks for, thank you all for joining us today. Um, hey, Michael. Yeah. When you send out the email, can you also be sure, you might be directing people to the website that has this, but maybe the, like the two or four pager that we put together for the project is a nice summary of some of the points in the slides. Um, yeah, the and handout. is a really, the handout, it's a really nice tool if you're an economic development professional and are talking to business owners um, that you can just give them that has sort of the quick and dirty on this um, as a takeaway. So um, right. we I'll had hard copies at our, our uh, road show, but since we're virtual. Right, I'll try to do that as, a, as an attachment. Um, it's also a link on the site, but uh, you know, uh, thanks everybody. Um, this, uh, this again was a part of the 
Business Retention and Expansion Community of Practice webinar series that we've been hosting here for three years at U of M Extension, but I've really enjoyed being part of this cooperative uh, kind of awareness raising because, you know, there's, as, as Courtney said, there are many, many businesses that will be transitioning in, in the near future, especially because of the pandemic. There's a lot of people who are going to get out now and they'd like to salvage that business for their community. So keep co-ops in mind, everybody, because they're, they're part of the continuum of, of possible solutions. It's not for everybody, but uh, reach out if you want more information. Uh, let's try to keep as many businesses in American communities as we can during this, this terrible time. And uh, we're all together. So thanks again for beaming in and we'll, we'll see you down the road. Bye, thanks. Bye-bye. Thank thanks Esther and Eric for helping on the sidelines there.